Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I apologize uh, for a little bit of chaos as we're, start, or as we're trying to get started. There's obviously been some changes to the webinar platform that we weren't aware of, so we're having some technical issues, but things should go smoothly from here. If you have any problems hearing us, just let us know in the chat box and we'll try to take care of that as soon as possible. This class will be recorded, so if you can't stay for the entire class or uh, you want to review it, we will be emailing it out to everybody that attended. Probably not today, but hopefully tomorrow is the goal. All right, so today we're going to talk about trading commodity option spreads with City Trader. Uh, City Trader is a is a platform that we've just recently begun offering to our clients. We're excited about it. It is a platform that is by far one of the most user-friendly platforms I've ever seen when it comes to option trading and especially spread trading, which is what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about ratio spreads, risk reversals, and strangles, uh, but we're also going to show you a few of the features on the platform that we think some of you might be interested in. And uh, before we get started, just want to introduce myself. My name is Carly Garner. I am a futures and options broker for DeCarly Trading in Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, if you have any questions or comments or anything about today's class, you can reach me by telephone or email, or you can always uh, visit our web address, decarlytrading.com. We have quite a few educational videos, such as the one you're going to be watching today, at least uh, archives of previous webinars anyway and uh, articles, all kinds of fun stuff. If you're on social media, we try to post charts and commentary and samples of our newsletters and things like that to Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, so we hope to see you there. Uh, just as a, if you're, if you're not aware of some of the things that we do or some of the, or who I am, I am a broker, a strategist, and an author. I do write a monthly column for Stocks and Commodities magazine. I also provide content to Jim Cramer's Mad Money, most of it uh, pertaining to commodities such as crude oil and gold, technical analysis, that sort of thing. And we also write a couple of newsletters for our clients, the Financial Futures Report and the DeCarly Perspective. We attempt to write them in an educational manner, uh, but the idea is also to teach as we go along, but in addition to that, uh, try to put together strategies and ideas and uh, you know provide research, that sort of thing. I've written four books, a couple of them more than once, but uh, the, the newest books available are Higher Probability Commodity Trading, and most recently a trader's first book on commodities. That's actually the third edition. I've rewritten that a couple times to keep up with uh, changes in the industry and that sort of thing. Higher Probability Commodity Trading is ideally, you know, everything you need to know once your trading account is open. And a trader's first book on commodities is everything you need to know before you actually open the account. So I just want to remind everybody that there is a substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options. It's not investing, it's trading. It is, there's a big difference, and this is not suitable for everyone. You know, whether, regardless of what strategy you use, whether it's option spreads or futures or combination of the two, you're going to have good times and bad times, and sometimes the, the swings can be surprising. So before we get into spread trading and the platform and that sort of thing, we're going to basically just cover the nuts and bolts of options to make sure that everybody's on the same page and they understand what we're talking about as we go. So first I want to mention why, why I'm a fan of option trading. Uh, believe it or not, not all brokers are. It's 
options are a little more complicated than futures and from a risk management standpoint, they're a little more difficult to manage and um, you might be asking yourself, why does my broker care about risk management? Well, the, the reality is in a trading account, in a commodity trading account, everybody's provided leverage and everyone's provided free leverage. So it's possible to lose more money than you have on deposit. And unfortunately, it does happen occasionally. So as a broker, it's very important that we can stay on top of the risk that our clients are taking, because even though it's their money, if they lose more than they have on deposit, it becomes our money. And so it's, uh, it's a little bit tricky. But I prefer options, regardless, or despite some of the opinions of other, uh, of other brokers, because they are incredibly versatile. And through a combination of both long and short options, it's possible to create basically any level of risk and re reward and leverage that you really want. So they're incredibly versatile. There's basically two types of options. There's calls and puts. Most of you probably know that. Uh, the call option gives the buyer to, I'm sorry, yeah, the call option gives the buyer of that option the right to buy the underlying futures contract at the stated strike price. A put option gives the buyer the right to sell the underlying futures contract at that stated strike price. Basically, buyers of options are acquiring the right and sellers are offering that right at a price that both parties are willing to agree on. Where a lot of people make mistakes is they assume that option trading is uh, the value or their profit and loss on a particular option trade is based on where the futures market is and uh, relative to where their strike price is. And that's not necessarily true because there are so many things that determine the value of an option before expiration, such as time value, volatility, demand, expected volatility. All these types of things will change the value of an option, even if the futures price doesn't necessarily change. So it's a little bit tricky, and again, it's a little more uh, there's it's a little more complex when it comes to figuring out how much money you might make or lose on a particular trade if F, if X Y Z happens. And again, as a, from a broker standpoint, they sometimes have a hard time determining what the true risk is. At expiration, it's easy to develop to figure out what the risk is, but any time before expiration, it's kind of a guessing game. So to put things in uh, into simplicity here. If you're bullish, you could, and you wanted to trade options outright, not necessarily through spreads, but outright. If you're bullish, you can either buy a call or sell a put. And if you're bearish, you could buy a put or sell a call. Now, unfortunately, a lot of beginning traders, they get it stuck in their mind that puts are bearish and calls are bullish, but they forget that if you're Selling a put, it means something different than buying a put, so just try to keep those uh, square for you. So the big difference between, before we go any further, the big difference between uh, buying an option and selling an option is when you buy an option, you have limited risk. When you sell an option, you have unlimited risk. And we're going to talk more about that, but I just want to make sure that, because um, I forgot to mention it on the last slide, make sure that that's something that you all understand. So there are times that it makes sense to be a net buyer of options, and there's times that it makes sense to be a net seller of options. But there, it's not any particular time without regard to volatility and, and that sort of thing isn't always going to be the best time to do one or the other. So the, the best thing a trader can do is analyze the market and determine what's going to be the best course of action. There are times simply just buying a call option outright is the best way to go about it. Uh, such times might be when volatility is low or in markets that are just quiet and there's low demand for option, nobody's paying attention to it. A good time to be a net seller of options is when the volatility is high, there's a lot of hype surrounding it, and uh, you know, there, there's just a lot of excitement. When markets are exciting and everybody's talking about it on TV and, or on social media, people want to be involved and so they bid the price of the options higher. So those are the times when you want to be a net seller. Now, it's, it sounds easy to say this on paper, but imagine as a trader, if the market's going wild and everybody is uh, excited about something, it's not always that easy to step in and take the other side. But that's probably 
exactly what most people should be doing. So Warren Buffett said it best when he says, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. As an option trader, you always want to keep that in the back of your mind. It's a lot easier said than done, but that's the overall goal. You want to be buying options when no one else wants them, and you want to be selling options when everybody wants them. So I tend to be a fan of option selling, or at least spread trading, as opposed to just outright buying options. And the reason being, options are an eroding asset. Each minute that passes reduces the value of any particular option. In my opinion, buying an option is similar to buying a car and watching it, the value plummet as you drive it off the lot. Time is always going to work against the buyer of an option, but it works in favor of the seller. If you've ever bought an option and slowly watched it erode to nothing, the seller has had the exact opposite experience. And more often than not, that's exactly what happens with options. Approximately 80% of options expire worthless, and roughly only 20% expire in the money. So with that in mind, you've probably realized that the odds of success are better as an option seller as they are a buyer. However, it's not that simple. When we talk about 80% of options expiring worthless, first of all, that's kind of a guess. Some some studies show that it's as many as 90, and others say it's as few as 70. But it's somewhere in that ballpark. But that also is misleading because you have to understand that just because an option expires worthless doesn't mean that at one point be between entry of that option and expiration, that option didn't gain in value dramatically. In fact, I've seen a lot of options that eventually expire worthless at some point during their option life are worth thousands and thousands of dollars. And sometimes they're worth thousands of dollars a week or two before expiration. So it's a little misleading to just say 80% of options expire worthless. Because let's face it, as an option seller or you know any type of trader in general, you're probably not going to be willing to hold on to those trades with that big a drawdown to find out if it's going to expire worthless. Most people would be forced out due to margin shortages, or maybe they just can't take the pain anymore, or maybe they've, you know, the market's made them change their minds. So, um, again, just I want to be completely transparent when I say that, yes, the odds of success in selling options are better, but it's not without a lot of stress and risk, and it's, and it's definitely not as easy as it sounds. So people are lured into long option strategies because it offers limited risk and unlimited reward. And on paper, that sounds like a great deal. But as we mentioned, just because you have those favorable characteristics, it doesn't mean that the odds of success are great. In fact, they're not. Most option buyers will lose money. Every once in a while, it works kind of like a casino or an insurance company. Every once in a while, a long option will pay off big to a trader. But most of the time, the trader will continue to pay premium and see the option just simply erode to nothing. It's a lot like buying car insurance. You pay the money every month. But one day you may get into an accident and file a claim, but you probably aren't. So as you can see, there's advantages and disadvantages to buying options and selling options. So the idea of a spread, the reason we're even talking about this, is the idea of a spread, an option spread, is to capitalize on, in, on both worlds. You basically get the good side of both strategies. You also get the bad side as well, but it, it spreads things out or uh, evens things out and it provides an inherent hedge to the trade. So again, I want to make sure everyone understands that the value of an option is going to fluctuate independent, well not, not independently, that's not the right word, but I should say on its own regardless of what the futures market is doing. For example, I'm sure a lot of you were following the E-mini S&P today the mini S&P continues to rally uncontrollably. Honestly, I, I'm out of words to, to describe what's going on in that market. But the reason I mention it is, if you would have looked at the option chains today, the call options were completely exploding in value, which is to be expected when a market's going up like that. But the put options really didn't lose much value. So you would think if with the S&P up 20, 25, 30 points, the put options should have lost a ton of value. But they didn't. I mean, they lost some, but not as much as you'd expect. So sometimes option prices 
option price doesn't necessarily correlate as much as you would think to the underlying futures market. Sometimes there's other things in play. There is demand for options. So in today's S&P example, there's probably a lot of traders out there trying to buy put options because they think what, while well, they're thinking what goes up must come down. The market's a little overbought. It's definitely due for some sort of a pullback, but it has been for a while and it hasn't paid off. But buying out of the money puts is a way to get the foot in the door without, you know, without having unlimited risk. And so that's what's happening. So as the futures market goes up, the puts are holding value or in some cases even gaining a little value. So the things that increase an in option price are basically timed expiration. The more time an option has, the more expensive it is. Increases in volatility or anticipation in volatility will increase an option price. As an option seller, what you want to see happening is time go by. So as an option gets closer to expiration, its value disintegrates. You want to see markets go quiet. You want to see a lack of interest and a lack of event risk. And those sorts of things will work against an option price and will work in favor of an option seller. OK, so now that we've covered the basics of options, let's talk about what an option spread is. An option spread is basically a combination of long and short options that work together toward a, top, a common goal. If you're a long option trader, if you're someone that likes to buy premium looking for the next big move, it might make sense for you to try to pay for that premium that you're buying by selling options around it. So for example, if you think a particular market is going to go down, let's say you think the S&P is going to go down, you could buy a put option. Put options are going to be very, very expensive in the S&P, even right now with volatility, uh, or at least put volatility low the options are still rather expensive. So what you might want to do is you could sell a put underneath the market, or you could sell a call above the market, or you could do a little bit of both. And you're going to use the money that you're collecting on those short options to pay for the option that you believe will be your money maker. Premium collectors, those that prefer to sell options, can do something similar, but instead of buying the primary option, the one that's more expensive and closer to the money, they would sell that option, and then they could buy one out of the money for, uh, as, for insurance purposes. So for example, a bearish S&P trader might sell a call option near the money and then buy a call option a little further out of the money, just in case they're wrong and the market continues higher. At least they can sleep at night and they know they have limited risk. As a spread trader, your position is inherently hedged. If the market goes up, some of the legs on your spread are going to make money. As the market goes down, some will lose money. So the purpose of spread trading is because spread traders enjoy the best of both worlds. It enables traders to reduce market volatility relative to trading futures outright or even trading outright options. And spreads can be created as a means of accomplishing various degrees of aggression and price speculation. You can control your margin with spreads, and you can control your risk. So while short option traders can use spreads to control their margin and their risk, long option traders can use it to control their cost, to reduce cost, because buying options are expensive, and we've already decided that more options than not expire worthless. So you don't want to spend a lot of money on a long option. You don't want to spend two or $3,000 on an option which is what, where they're priced a lot of times. Sometimes, you know, some markets, for example, corn or wheat or something like that, you can buy cheap options that are relatively close to the market. But if you're looking at crude oil or the S&P or treasuries, that's hard to do. So in those markets, it's probably a good idea to use spreads to reduce your cost. So, in summary, the idea is you want to use the market's money to buy options, not your own. For every option that you buy, you probably want to consider selling at least one or maybe two in order to finance the trade. And again, I'm talking about markets that have expensive options, not corn. You can go out and buy a corn option for four or 500 bucks relatively close to the market with three or four months to expiration. So it doesn't make sense in a market like that to do a spread unless, uh, unless maybe you're going out to May or July options, and you know you can do some sort of a spread. But if you're trading March corn, you're probably better off just going long 
some sort of option and, and letting it ride. Okay, so when we talk about option sellers spread trading, we're generally talking about vertical spread, where, where a bullish trader, like I mentioned before, a bullish trader in the S&P might sell a call option and then buy a call option a little further out of the market. Um, this limits risk, it reduces stress, it lowers margin. But I want to also point out that it, there are some arguments against premium collection spread trading, which uh, I've we've in the past we've done some webinars on it, and we've we talk about it in uh, some of our books. Because what happens is if people are are selling spreads, a lot of times they have a tendency to trade a higher quantity because the margins are lower, and they can. And so if something goes wrong, that higher quantity works against them. If you're short one or two contracts and a market goes against you, usually it's not the end of the world. If you're short 10 contracts, even as a spread, the risk can pile up substantially, especially with options. Options have a tendency to explode in value. They'll trade weeks sideways or quietly, and it, it just seems like as an option seller, sometimes it seems like easy money. And then the market... Uh, reminds you just how how dangerous it can be. So let's talk about uh, City Trader itself for a few minutes and then we'll get on to some of the various option spreads that we're going to talk about today. Okay, so there's a few things I want to talk about when it comes to option trading platforms for commodity traders. And someone just asked recently in the chat box what's the best platform for analyzing and trading futures options. So in the next couple slides, I think I'm going to answer that question for you. There, the truth is, uh, City Trader is a fabulous platform, especially for option spreads, because it's extremely user-friendly. That said, the truth is, commodity option platforms have historically lagged in regards to technology relative to stock option platforms, and probably because Everybody you know trades stocks, and maybe not everybody trades stock options, but a lot more people trade stock options than trade commodity options. So that's where a lot of the uh, development money has gone, to stock platforms. City Trader is trying to reverse that trend, and they've incorporated option spread trading, which is relatively, I don't want to say rare, in commodity trading platforms because there are a handful that do have the capability, but I can tell you that most of them um, aren't very user-friendly, and ma it makes it very difficult for the average retail trader to place spreads on most platforms because a lot of them require that you have some sort of knowledge about order etiquette. For example, premium always has to be on the buy side. You always have to list the closer to the money strike first, those types of things that, you know, brokers that have been doing this for years, we we just know that. We don't think twice about it. But somebody that's new that knows all about vertical spreads but doesn't know the commodity trading etiquette might have a hard time using other platforms. City Trader, however, does a lot of that work for you. You just drag positions into a spread builder, and it does it automatically, so you don't have to think about it. So another thing I also want to point out is um, when it comes to option analytics, there are some platforms out there that get really fancy with it. Some of them are very expensive, some of them aren't. I, you know, I'm not a big fan of spending a lot of money on option analytics because in my humble opinion, I think you can find all the information you need just by looking at basically the delta and an option chain and, you know, a few things like that. I really, when you start talking about probability cal calculators and all that kind of stuff, it's really not going to give you a whole lot more detailed information than just looking at the delta would. And in addition to that, whether you're looking at delta or some fancy option calculator, the reality is they're taking parameter, a snapshot of today's parameters, but those can change in the blink of an eye. So for example, I've seen options that, uh, you know, traders will sell options that have, according to their fancy calculator, have a 97% chance of expiring worthless today. And then tomorrow it goes against them and they're down several thousand dollars and their calculator is telling them it only has an 80% chance of expiring worthless. And then the next day they're down even more and it's telling them, well, they only have a 60% chance of expiring worthless. So 
the reason I bring that up is we all know that it's a snapshot and it doesn't guarantee that to be the same tomorrow. However, the problem with those are people will tend to get complacent if their software tells them that the odds of the option expiring in the money, they automatically, in their brain, they think, well, I have a 97% chance of making money on that, which I mentioned before isn't necessarily true because before expiration, those options can get very expensive, even if they do end up expiring worthless. So you want to be really careful not to rely on fancy calculators and what they're telling you and get too complacent and let the market run over you, um, which obviously can happen anyway, even if you're not complacent or even, you know, people, trading's hard and people make mistakes, it just, it happens. But uh, those calculators tend to be kind of a, a, a crutch for traders and I think it can get them into trouble. Another thing to keep in mind is not all spreads are recognized by the exchange. Because if, if you can imagine, in any particular market, there are probably thousands, hundreds of thousands or more various spread capabilities. Like, for example, there's hundreds of strike prices and various expiration dates. And so each trader probably has a different idea of which strikes and how exactly they want to construct their spread. But the exchange doesn't have any capability of listing every possible spread, nor would a market maker have any interest or the time to quote each and every spread possibility. So they're just not listed. So as we go through uh, City Trader, I'll show you how you can pull up some, some pre-designed uh, pre spreads. And that means that some other trader at some other point has probably traded that spread. So it is listed on the exchange. But, but this is a a challenge that all platforms have. Um, any platform that offers spread trading is going to have this issue. It's not the platform's fault. It's just the way that the, the markets are. In the world of open outcry, we didn't have that problem because we just called the trading floor and we were talking to humans and they could easily build a spread for us. It was no big deal. But in electronic markets, it's a little different. So if you go shopping for a spread on City Trader and you find that the exact strike prices and arrangement that you that you want to trade isn't there, you can build your own. And it's as easy as dragging positions into a spread builder and then creating it. And then from there, you can hit an RFQ button, which stands for request for quote. And that's basically pinging a market maker and saying, hey, I'd like to trade the spread. Can you quote it for me? The problem is it's going to take a little time for all of that to happen. So in some instances, you might be better off just legging into the spread. And again, it's not a fault of City Trader; it's a, it's just a fault of uh, the marketplace itself, and you know the electronic world we live in. Everything is binary, so it, it complicates things a little bit. Okay, let's talk about ratio spreads. So this is going to be a little easier for you to uh, to see with the screenshots. So. Uh, basically, ratio spreads can be constructed in an infinite number of ways, but they generally in involve a one by two, which means you're either you're buying one option and selling two, or some traders will sell one option and buy two for insurance. Depending on how it's structured, it might involve limited or unlimited profit potential, and it may have limited or unlimited risk. So it's a little bit tricky, and, and it's uh, something that traders can customize as they see fit. But we're gonna, today we're just going to talk about a, a one by two because that's generally what most traders are doing. So the premise of a ratio spread is like we were talking about before. It's to finance a long option with the premium that we're collecting from the two short options. So assuming that more options expire worthless than not, the odds of success are going to be a little better for a spread like this than they would be if you just simply bought the option outright. So in City Trader, this is what it might look like if you clicked on spreads. Let me get my highlighter out here. So if you clicked on the spread button up here, you would then see a list, almost a chain, an option chain of spreads. And assuming that you saw the strike prices that you wanted to trade, you could just click on that particular row and it would start building your order ticket. So it's very simple. Again, we could have gotten to this screen and placed the spread on a ratio in about three or four clicks. 
So it's rare for a platform that has option spreads to be that that convenient. Where things might get a little tricky is understanding how the spread works. Remember how I told you before some platforms are a little confusing for other traders because when they're building a spread, they don't know the etiquette, they don't know the order of the strike prices and where the premium goes and all that kind of stuff. Well, City Trader does that for you um, in the pre built spreads and also in the spread builder. But you'll notice it'll, you'll see right here whether you're buying or selling in the quantity. It constructs that all for you. In this case, it happens to be exactly what we wanted to do. We wanted to buy a put and then sell two puts underneath the market to pay for it. So that's exactly what we were wishing to do. So we buy the spread. And the limit price would be 50 cents, meaning we're paying 50 cents for that spread, or 500 bucks. And I'll show you in the next chart why that might be a good deal. Okay, so a moderately bearish trader in crude oil might look to pay for a long option, a long put option, with two out of the money puts at a strike that they don't think is going to be seen. This reduces the cost of the long put to $500 from $1,000, and it provides a pro profit potential of about $3,500. So keep in mind, like when you're doing this, your profit potential is limited. It's not unlimited. If you just bought the 54 put outright, if you just bought this option outright, your profit potential would be unlimited, but it would cost you $1,000. And again, I'll say it probably 100 more times in this during this webinar, most options expire worthless. So if you're spending $1,000 on something that will most likely expire worthless, it's probably not ideal. But if you can reduce your cost to 500 by selling these two options, then you know $500 isn't gonna do too much damage and it gives you profit potential all the way down to $50. So basically, in a nutshell, you are making just as much as you would had you bought the option. Now, I'm assuming at expiration, again, before expiration is a little more difficult, but at expiration, you would make just as much as you would for the 54 put as a spread as you would have just buying the put outright, but you saved yourself $500. However, if the mark, if you're too right, if the market goes below 50, you start giving that money back and you run out of money down here. So with this type of trade, you have a pretty decent profit potential and a nice big range to be right. With uh, The problem with this trade is if you're too right, you run out of money here and then you start, it's basically like being long a futures contract under your break-even point. So it's not without its additional risk. It's basically an opportunity cost. So you're paying less to get into the trade in exchange for accepting a little bit of risk of on the downside if you happen to be too wrong. But on the upside, your risk is limited to what you paid for the spread. So again, this spread in within the City Trader platform could have been put together with a few clicks. So let's just review the advantages and disadvantages of ratio spreads. The advantage of a ratio spread, which again is buying one option and then selling two out of the money to pay for it is there's a low out-of-pocket expense. The margin is generally very low because your risk is relatively low unless the mar like in, in that previous example, unless crude oil crashes, crashes probably isn't the right word, but collapses, you really have very little risk. The profit potential is large and the probability of, of a profit range is actually quite large. In that previous example, you noticed you really Unless the market does something really insane on the downside or you just simply were wrong, there's, there's really not a lot of ways to lose money on that trade. Of course, we, you know, we're all wrong here and there. That's part of the game. In fact, um, sometimes, unfortunately, it happens, happens a lot. You have to keep in mind as you're as you're trading. It sometimes can get very frustrating. But even some of the better traders on the planet, their win loss ratio is forty to fifty percent. So you have to be 
you know, just recognize how difficult that this game is and proceed as you, you know, even if you make a m couple mistakes along the way, allowing those mistakes to change your strategy or change your mindset as you go forward is another mistake. You have, if you found an edge and you think your strategy works, stick with it and just push through. There's going to be definitely always going to be hard times. So the disadvantages of ratio spreads is, if, like we mentioned before, if you're too right and the bottom falls out, you, you're going to get into trouble and that's frustrating because the idea of that the original ratio spread we were looking at is you think the market's going lower and you are right, but because it, you were too right, you lose money. That's, that's a hard thing to swallow. But the good news is that, thing is that kind of thing is very rare. It takes a really big move for a ratio spread to get into trouble like that. Another problem with ratio spreads is if the volatility in increases, the trader can feel trapped. And that's because, let's say you put on a one by two put spread and the market does go down as you think it was going to, but the money that you're making on the long put is being overshadowed or almost engulfed by the losses on the short put. If the market moves sharp enough, that can happen and that can be frustrating as well. So you feel like you're stuck in the trade and you have to just sit on it and wait for some time to erode so that those short options will lose value. You can even get yourself into a situation where the paper loss on the short options outpaces the gains on the long options. So you can be right and actually lose money on a trade like that. If you're patient and you let it play out, usually it'll correct itself, but there can be temporary periods of time where it can be extremely frustrating to have a ratio spread on. So another trade that we're going to look at is called a risk reversal. And this, can, this trade can actually be extremely aggressive if you're just purely speculating or it can be used as portfolio insurance. So if you are if you have a stock portfolio that you want to buy insurance for, but you don't want to spend the money on a put option to do it, this is a great way to do that. It's called a risk reversal. And the idea is you buy a call or a put, which is your money maker, and then you sell the opposite to pay for it. So for example, if you were speculating in the S&P and you were bearish, you might buy a, a put option and then use, and then, I'm sorry, buy a put option and then sell a call option to pay for it. You could do the exact same thing as, a, as an insurance play. So if you're holding a couple hundred thousand dollars in a portfolio that's roughly um, similar to the S&P 500, you could hedge that by going to the futures market, selling a call option above, and then buying a put below. And that way you get, you're, it's basically free insurance. You're insuring your portfolio. The only thing you're giving up is profit potential if the market rallies sharply. But um, for a lot of traders, especially if the market's really, really lofty like it is today, in, in my opinion, but I thought that a little while ago, it might, be, you know, it might be worth giving up a few extra percentage points on the top if you can protect yourself from a fallout. So in City Trader, you can put something like this together. They're relatively simple. Now keep in mind, there are not a lot of traders that are trading risk reversals. So you'll notice as you sort through some of these different strategies here, uh, some of them are going to have several uh, option strategies listed and some of them might only have a couple. And that's because, again, not everybody's trading every spread. So when you go to risk reversals, you'll notice that there's only a handful that the exchange has actually listed. And that's, you know, you, but you could create your own or you could, if you find the strike prices you want to trade with, you can use anything that's available already. Obviously, it's a lot more convenient to trade a spread that already exists because it's a couple of clicks and you're in the market, boom. If you have to build a spread, it's not the end of the world, but it takes a little, a little more time. So if it's a fast moving market, honestly, I think you're probably better off as, rather than building a spread from scratch and then requesting a quote, I think you're better off just legging into the spread, which is what we do a lot of times anyway. And with City Trader, it would be very easy to do that very quickly without uh, having to actually build the spread and hope that a market maker will quote it. Because if markets are moving fast and the volatility is high, sometimes a couple of minutes can make a really big difference in your fill quality. So somebody's asking if these risk reversals are heavily margined. 
it depends on which market you're doing it in. We're, this example that we're talking about here is the S&P, and the S&P margin is pretty hefty. So I'd have to say in the S&P, the answer to that's probably yes. Depending on the strike prices you use, probably going to be anywhere from three to 4,000. Um, but, I mean, you know, you could do it in crude oil or gold or anything like that for a little bit less. And if you wanted to get real cheap, you could do it in wheat or co corn for really probably less than a couple, less than four or 500 bucks. So it just depends on the market. So in this situation, we're going to um, choose the, uh, the January 2650 call and buy the 2350 put. In City Trader, we would just click on this row. It populates our order ticket. So we click on it, and it, and it already populates it into the ex exchange accepted format, which is the opposite of what we're doing. We're basically selling the call and buying the puts, which is the opposite of how the exchange lists it, which means we would sell the spread. So it's a little bit confusing. It, I highly recommend that you practice some of this stuff before you actually go into a live account environment but you'll notice that it's near even money. And the reason we're doing these particular strike prices, if you're doing portfolio insurance, you may want to spread out your strike prices a little bit. If you're speculating, you may even want to go a little closer, but this is just an example. This is basically a free trade. When I say near even money, I'm talking about the premium. So the limit price is 0.55, that's basically $25. So this trader is getting in, oh here, actually it shows you right here, $27.50, you can buy this spread. And again, we're selling the call and buying the put. Let me show you how it might look on a chart. Okay, now I put this chart together a week or two ago, and obviously the S&P is uh, much higher now. In fact, the S&P is right at 2650, or maybe 2640 as we speak. So as it turns out, this trade didn't work out superbly, but if you were using it as portfolio insurance, actually, it still wouldn't be too bad because at this 2650 level, you're giving up upside potential on your portfolio, but you still have insurance, and that's really what the, the point of it was. And you still get dividends and all that kind of stuff in your portfolio. So this was a nice hedge, and it was probably a good bet. And even though the market is here, I'd say odds of it going higher probably aren't that great. For full disclosure, I said that a few weeks ago, and we are definitely higher. So we'll see how it pans out. Uh, somebody's asking, is there a difference in margin requirement for one index ratio spreads for calls versus puts? Margin is um, margin's difficult because it, it, it depends on the strike prices you're choosing in the month. So there's really not a right or wrong answer to that question. But I can tell you that, like, we'll take the S&P, for example. The calls, the call ratios tend to be more expensive than the put ratios, which for a lot of people, it doesn't make sense, but the reason being, call options in the S&P are generally priced at lower levels than put options because, let's face it, the S&P usually, although not recently, but usually the S&P goes down faster than it goes up, and the market knows that, and traders know that. So they put a premium in puts, like basically puts are priced more expensively because traders know that the market can fall faster than it rises. So because of that, you can put together a put spread, a put ratio spread at lower strike prices in the S&P relative to what you could do in the calls. In the calls, you'd have to have the spread like right on top of the market or pretty close, and so the risk is a little greater on the calls in theory just because it's closer to the market. So uh, again, it's tricky, but yeah, generally, the further you go away from the market with your short strike prices, the lower the margin is going to be. But I'd say if you're doing anything like this in the S&P with a ratio spread, you're probably looking at, on the call side, probably a couple thousand in margin. On the put side, you might be able to do it for a thousand or less. It just depends on how you're structuring your strike prices. So just to make sure you understand what we're doing with this risk reversal, it's a risk reversal is a way for free and efficient portfolio insurance. And when I say free, I'm talking about out-of-pocket costs. Someone did mention is this margined? Yes, this would be margined. And with the mark, with the S&P where it is today, the margin on this would have gone up uh, since the time this trade was initiated. So the margin's probably going to be about four grand on something like this. Right now, it probably started out closer to three. 
So not free in regards to margin, but free in regards to cash because you sold the call and then you use for twenty dollars or a thousand bucks, and then you use that thousand dollars to buy a put. Now, obviously, the trader probably would have basically been better off not having insurance, but we didn't know that at the time. Okay, so the advantages and disadvantages of risk reversal. The advantages are it's highly customizable. It can you, you basically can get off a free trade. So if, if you were doing that as a speculation instead of a hedge, obviously um, you'd be a little more stressed out as if you did it as a hedge because the trade obviously would have gone against you from two weeks ago to now. However, um, it doesn't deny the fact that the the odds of success are still pretty good. I mean, even, you know, we've been talking about this over and over. Just because the option is near the money right now doesn't mean that at expiration it's going to be in the money. Or, you know, if the S&P just stops here and doesn't go any higher, this trade is basically a break even. The other advantage of a risk reversal is there's no need to hold the expiration. So on the ratio spread, we mentioned that sometimes you can kind of get trapped into the trade because of the extrinsic value on the short options. But in a risk reversal, the profits can be pretty quick if you're accurate. So you can get in and out really quickly and efficiently without having to worry about waiting for time value to erode and that sort of thing. So risk reversals can be a good way to swing trade. They don't have to be long-term positions. They can be something that you hold for a day or two with a little less risk than the outright future. The disadvantage is a risk reversal is really not much of a spread at all. We call it a spread, but it's not because as, as the market goes up, you're basically losing on both legs. If the market goes down, you're also losing on both legs. Or I'm, I'm sorry, you're making on both legs. So there's... It's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit tricky. It's, it's not the type of spread that hedges itself, but it, it is something that, um, if it's constructed correctly, can make a lot of sense. But you have to be careful with where you put the strike prices and that sort of thing. Clarify, with a risk reversal, there is no hedge built into the spread. Both positions are correlated. They're both going to profit at the same time or lose at the same time, and so it kind of contradicts the idea of a spread, but I did want to discuss it because it's not something that you hear about a lot, and especially when it when we're talking about portfolio insurance with the market as high as it is. Now, if, if there's ever a time in the history of the S&P, it's probably now to consider insuring your portfolio, and so it's just something to, to throw out there so that everybody understands that that is a tool that's available to them. So now we'll talk about a, a type of spread that actually really is a spread. It's a short option strangle. Most of you have done this before. You sell a call, you sell a put. The idea is the there's, generally speaking, there's a relatively high probability of success, and there's relatively low margin. It's a lack of direction type of a trade. Once again, within the city trader, we can do it with a couple of clicks. The nice thing about this particular spread is uh, that although we, almost all, like the, the proper format of a strangle is a buy, a buy strangle. So this platform will automatically do that for you, create it in a, in a way that the exchange will easily accept it, and then you just sell it. So you'll notice you click on this, on the spread itself, and it automatically puts it in as a buy one and a sell, and a, sorry, a buy one and a buy one. But if you simply sell the spread, you're doing the opposite. You get to collect that premium instead of pay it. So in this case, you're collecting roughly just under $1,000. If you did want to buy the spread, of course, you could do that. If you would rather spend $1,000 betting that the S&P is either going to go above 2740 or below 2200 at expiration, you could do that. Now this is a, let's look at a chart and see what it might look like. So to be honest, this is probably not a strategy that I would use in the S&P. I'm not saying it's horrible. In fact, if you look at it, it actually probably would work out. But the reason I wouldn't do it is, first of all, the March options, which is what we would be selling with this strategy, have about 105 days to expiration. A lot can happen in 100 days. I mean, we, it could be a completely different world 100 days from now. Collecting premium and just hoping that over the next three months, 
things don't change to me is, is probably not the best way to do it. And also it's important to realize a lot of times with um, non-directional premium collection like this, if the market trades sideways, these options probably won't lose that much value because there's so much time on them. Markets, or I'm sorry, options generally lose most of their value in the last month and a half or so. So the three months out, you have a lot of risk because if something breaks out and moves against you, you're there, but not a lot of reward because there's no, not much uh, premium erosion going on. So in this particular example, a trader that believes the S&P couldn't rally more than 8% or decline more than 14% over a four-month time frame might sell a 2740, 2200 strangle. You might be wondering why those strike prices were chosen. To be honest, I only chose them because they were conveniently available in the, uh, on the, as an exchange-traded spread, so that's what I did. But I mean, I just wanted to give you an idea of, first of all, how easy it is to trade such a spread in the platform, but second, give you an idea of how this type of spread might work. Uh, again, on paper, it looks like a very high probability trade, but there is probably going to be a lot of stress. This trader would probably be stressed out um, quite a bit over the life of that particular trade. There's probably better ways to make $1,000 in the market, but um, you know, then again, Nobody can see the future, so we don't know how anything's going to work out. But the market right now is at 26.50, obviously nowhere near the 27.50 strike price or 27.40. But I would venture to say I didn't look at the option value today, but I bet it's a heck of a lot more expensive than $10. My guess is it's probably closer to 25 or 30 total guess. But uh, you know, assuming that I'm right, it's clear that even though the futures price is nowhere near the option strike price. That trader's probably under a little bit of margin pressure, maybe a little bit of psychological pressure. So that's the hard part about option trading and option selling is most people just assume that it, as long as the futures price doesn't exceed the option strike price, that they're not gonna lose money as an option seller. And on the flip side, option buyers think that if they, you know, as long as the market gets up to their strike price, they're gonna make money. And that's not necessarily true either. If someone would have bought this strangle, for $20, the market would have to be at 2770 before they break even. So at expiration, the market would have to be all the way up here just to break even. As a seller, you see you make money in this entire area. So the odds of making money as an option seller are far greater than that as an option buyer. However, um, the buyer has the benefit of, or of limited risk. So uh, somebody's asking, can a trader select a shorter expiration on the short strangle? Yes, absolutely. I just chose that because it happened to be a pre-made strategy built into the, the exchange's server. But you could create your own strangle, or if you went to, um, I would assume if you went to toggle through a couple other uh, expiration months of, of those futures, you'd find a heck of a lot more strangles. I was just, this was just for an example purpose. but. You can call, like for example, when I was pulling up uh, S&P option spreads, I think I was looking at the March futures. If you went to, would have went to December, you would have found a, you know, a list of uh, quite a few more strangles, I would, I would assume. So it just depends. But if you don't see anything you like, you just build one. It's not that big of a deal. And even if you don't have time or the desire to build one, you can just leg in. You can just sell the call and then sell the put and do it the old fashioned way. So on a side note, uh, if you do, leg into a strangle, there's a couple things. A lot of people assume that if you don't trade it as a spread, if you don't trade it as a package, that you're gonna be margined differently, and that's not true. The exchange will margin at the same, whether you leg into it or you sell it, sell the strangle as a package in a platform like City Trader. So in City Trader, you would have the option to leg in, to trade this package, it's gonna be treated exactly the same. And once it's in an open position, you would be able to see the delta on your position and all that kind of stuff. It actually runs the Greeks on your position itself once the position's open. From any type of practical standpoint, it really doesn't matter if you leg in or enter as a spread other than convenience and fill quality and that sort of thing. Depending on the situation, you may get better fill quality legging in or it depends on the situation. Unfortunately, there's not a hard and fast rule. So it's something that a trader, as a trader, you'll just kind of learn as you go. So the advantages of short strangles is that uh, they provide high odds of success at expiration, but at any time before expiration, they can be susceptible to large drawdowns like we just discussed. They do offer discounted margins, 
but if you sell them too far before expiration, it's all risk and no reward, like we just spoke about. The options lose most of their value in the last month, month and a half. So if you're selling options that have five, six months on them, you're not really going to make a whole lot of money until you get down to the last month of the option life, but you have all of that risk. So in my opinion, it doesn't make a lot of sense. The great thing about an option, short option strangle, is you can make money whether the market goes up, down, or sideways. Your only risk is if it goes up or down dramatically, which does happen occasionally. Okay, and another disadvantage of option strangles, if an option market is broken, it's possible that calls and puts can gain value together in extreme volatility. So today we were talking about how the S&P went, went nuts, for, for lack of a better word, on the upside, and the calls were gaining in value dramatically, but the puts didn't lose that much value. So I, for example, I know for a fact because I was following them today, like the March 2,500 puts, um, I think they started the day around 29 points, maybe 20, 28, and they ended somewhere around 26. So, I mean, they only lost a couple of points, and the S&P was up huge. On the flip side of that, the calls got really expensive. Somebody trading a short strangle would have would have gotten hardly any benefit from the short put, which was supposed to be their hedge, but they would have been hammered on the short calls. In other words, what I'm trying to make sure you understand is that there's not, um, there's not a lot of black and white. There's a lot of gray area when it comes to options, and there's no rules. There's, you know, there's theories, but option behavior ultimately depends on the cumulative behavior of traders, and that's unpredictable because we're humans. So if somebody's asking about short straddle margins. I mean, again, it depends on which market you're talking about and which um, month, expiration month you're using and that sort of thing. In a market like crude oil, I think you can get a straddle off for maybe two or 3,000 in a market, actually, yeah, about two or 3,000. In a market like gold, you're probably looking for 5,000. S&P, you're probably looking somewhere around 4,000. 4, um, but if you go to corn or wheat, so you're probably looking at five, 600 bucks. So it just really depends on the market and exactly what you're trying to do. So and someone else is bringing up a good um, point about a lot of times options will inflate ahead of big news announcements. So you see it in the treasuries ahead of the non-farm payroll or the S&P ahead of the non-farm payroll. You also see it in the weekly inventories in crude oil and um, any grain report. Like a day or so before the numbers, the options kind of build in a, a little extra padding for event risk. Once the event is over, the options tend to deflate, and they can do so if, if something's a non-event and people were expecting a real big market mover and nothing happens, the options collapse really quickly. So it's very nice to be an option seller ahead of the news and to take advantage of that. The flip side of that is sometimes the news ends up being shocking and the market uh, panics and prices move and you get caught in a bad trade. But more often than not, options will lose value after a big news event. So we kind of spoke to this about this before. There are limitations to spread trading order entry, and I'm not saying this is something that's uh, unique to the, uh, the, the city trader platform, because it's not. This is just all commodity option trading, regardless of platform you're using. Not all possible spreads are listed. Not all listed spreads are liquid. And if you build your own spread and request a quote, it requires some time and that might be time that you don't have. And also it requires the market maker to respond quickly, and sometimes that doesn't happen, not to his fault, but just maybe they're busy. Maybe they've got other things going on. It's a lot more efficient for them to quote options individually, so that's kind of what they focus on. So sometimes it actually makes more sense to leg into the spread. Uh, in other words, place the buy leg on one ticket, place the sell leg on the other ticket. I usually place the buy legs on the on the bid and then the sell legs on the ask and then I toggle the prices in towards the middle to basically split the bid ask and get them filled. Sometimes when I'm using platforms that have spread trading capabilities, I still do this. I still leg in just because it's a little easier in some scenarios and some scenarios it's not. It, it really just depends. But um, as a trader, you have to just kind of get used to you know what works for you and, and what you're more, more comfortable with. So should you place orders as spreads? The answer is sometimes, sometimes not. It just depends on what exactly you're trying to do. The advantages of trading spreads as a package is you don't have a risk of getting filled on one leg and not the other. 
and I know a lot of beginning traders who are just unaware of um, the time of day that certain announcements are made. For example, you know, if you tried to place a on a USDA report day in the grains, if you tried to place a spread order, an option spread order at say um, 9 a.m. Pacific time, which is when the USDA announces the report, but you didn't, you know, you're not aware of that. Sometimes you'll place one leg and then by the time you go to place the other, the market's completely different. So if you place it as a spread package, there's no risk of something crazy like that happening and you're getting stuck with one leg and not the other of your spread. So that is, so if, if at all possible and convenient, it's probably better to place it as a spread most of the time. But at the same time, you don't want to waste 10, 15 minutes trying to get your spread in when you could have done it in 30 seconds. So you just be mindful of what exactly is going on and if the market's moving. On a quiet day, it might not matter so much. On a busy day, it does. Placing spreads as packages is far less stressful, eliminates the risk of slippage, that sort of thing. But there's, there's some stress that comes with building spreads and then using the RFQs. So again, just be mindful of what's going on. So I want to thank everybody for coming today. And uh, if you have any questions or anything, just let us know. I'm going to show you my contact information here <clears throat> in a few slides. But first, I want to remind you, if you if you have any interest, I mean, there's only so much information we can cover in a an hour-long webinar. So we kind of skim across everything, and I hope it's um, hope it's not too difficult for everybody to to follow along. But if you do want to learn more, we go into a lot more detail and it's probably a lot better organized in our books, Higher Probability Commodity Trading and Trader's First Book on Commodities. And uh, again, as a reminder, a Trader's First Book on Commodities is basically everything you need to know before you actually start trading. And then Higher Probability Commodity Trading is what you need to know um, to put your strategy together, to analyze the markets, placing trades, that sort of thing. So here's my contact information. If there's anything I can do for you, please just let me know. We'd love to hear from you. And if, you, if you're on social media, be sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram.